Good morning. Good morning. Welcome you all to our family service for this 12th Sunday after Pentecost as we continue to rejoice in the gifts of Christ that have come to us in this church. Uh, a word to those of you who may be joining us on video, if you want to get a bulletin of the service, you can go to our website, www.mountcalvarypeoria.org, and look for news and announcements, and you'll find the bulletin there. With that said, everyone wave at one another. This is our passing of peace right now. Don't pass coups, just pass peace. And last but not least, if you uh, would take time to fill out one of the uh, registration cards, you may leave those in the offering plate as you depart this morning, and you may depart with an offering there as well. So with that said, we will begin our service with the opening hymn, Joyful, Joyful, and Joy.
and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called ordained servant of Christ in my authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. 
morning comes from the prophet Isaiah, the 51st chapter. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who bore you. For he was but one when I called him that I might bless him and multiply him. For the Lord comforts Zion. He comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving in the voice of song. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation. For a law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. My righteousness draws near, my salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me, and for my arm they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath for the heavens vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. Here ends the reading. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Second reading continues from Paul's letter to the Romans, the 11th and 12th chapter. Oh, the depth and the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been His counselor? Or who has given a gift to Him that He might be repaid? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, in proportion to our faith. If service, in our serving. The one who teaches, in his teaching. The one who exhorts, in his exhortation. The one who contributes, in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Here ends the reading. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Pray to stand in the gospel verse. Hallelujah! You are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. The will of the Father and to 
So I bid you all grace, mercy, and peace. For God the Father, for our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so Peter answered that question that was put to the disciples, and which is put to all of us, really. Who do you say that I am? Now there's so much going on in this exchange between Peter and Jesus that it's easy to lose sight of what stands at the heart of this moment. But this morning, let's seek to be clear about that. What stands at the center here is this, the confession, you are the Christ. One of the things that keeps us from grasping what a big deal Peter's confession is, is that we're used to calling Jesus Christ all the time. We do it so much, in fact, that I think the word almost loses its meaning. Or you'd ask the average Christian, the average Christ in what the word Christ literally means, you'd be likely to get a blank stare. And worse yet, there are Bible scholars, in an effort to keep too much from being made at this moment, who point out that there are plenty of other places where people early in Jesus' public ministry acknowledge that he is the promised Messiah, the one who Moses and all the prophets wrote about. And so they ask, well, what's the big deal about this anyway? Well, the big deal is that in calling Jesus, a man who was born in Bethlehem, who was raised in Nazareth, who was baptized in the Jordan River by John, in calling Jesus the Christ, the anointed one, Messiah, in doing that, Peter is acknowledging that this man standing in front of him is the chosen servant of Yahweh, sent to bring all of the Lord's promises of old to completion, sent to usher in the kingdom of God on earth, sent to bring forth a new creation and appointed to restore our broken fellowship with the most holy one. And that is a pretty tall order for one man to accomplish. To confess that Jesus is the Christ is to say that everything in history hinges on him and him alone, on his life, his words, his work, is to say that there's no hope of redeeming the past without him. That all history leading to him makes no sense if he is not walking on the earth and doing what it was that he was given to do. It says that all of our future has no hope without him. Only because he is who he is and does what he does does the future unfold as something other than a continued reign of darkness. So with all that, you can see why some were hesitant to call Jesus Messiah. And why to this day there are many who cannot conceive of granting Jesus such authority, such power. It boggles the mind. You can see well why Jesus told Peter that flesh and blood had not revealed this to him, this understanding that Jesus is the Christ, but that it was revealed to Peter by the Father. For how on earth do you figure out that Jesus is the Christ? How do you figure out who the Christ really is? And it's not like you can come up with a checklist, do a scientific investigation, see what identifies a person as the one upon whom all creation depends, and then go out looking to see who exactly fits the bill. In our searches, in our guessing, there's always the possibility that we're mistaken. We cannot come to certainty about Jesus by our own wisdom or knowledge. It has to be worked in us by another. Or into our hearts and minds so deeply, so completely, that we could not abandon the truth of who Jesus is any more than we could deny that we exist or that creation is real. And that happens. We come to know Jesus the Christ as we encounter him here in the assembly of believers. Gathered around his word and his sacraments, here we come to live with him and receive his gifts. Here we are given life in him so that we are made new. And yet for all the Father's work to sink that knowledge deep into our hearts and into our bones, there are times that you and I, we still balk at living with Jesus as Christ the Lord. And here's what I mean, right? Have you ever had one of those times in your life when you were convinced the world was coming to an end for you because there was a bad turn, maybe in a job, or maybe an investment you made went completely? Maybe a relationship was sour, or you suffered from a health problem, an injury, maybe you got caught in some sin, maybe you even got caught in a crime. Maybe it's COVID stuff, right? Has finally shattered your bodies, and now you find yourself wondering what's next? Will there ever be a return to normal? When we're at a loss, 
But everything seems to have gone wobbly as depression or fear or doubt kept you awake at night. As your mind wandered over and over and over again, what am I going to do? How am I going to go on? Will I make it with those who I love make it? What's going to happen next? In all that darkness and anxiety, do you see that you've lost grasp of Jesus as Christ and Lord? It's not that you've lost your faith, per se, but in letting the troubles of this life dominate everything. You've slipped off your foundation there. You've lost your rock. For if Christ is your all in all, if you trust that every promise of God to you is yes and amen in Him, that He's redeemed you, was working all things together for your benefit, then how could fear or dread actually own you? And I'm not talking about folks who struggle with clinical depression here. That's another issue. I'm just addressing this human tendency that we all have to fear disaster when things don't go the way we expect. And I want to point out that that particular kind of fear is the opposite of seeing and believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, who is with you and who is for you in the midst of thick and thin. Now, there's another way that we can lose our moorings as well. And, you know, here, I'm just going to ask you, have you ever thought that you're going to have made, that, that life is going to be perfect, that all will be well for you and for those you love, if, if you win the publisher's clearing house sweepstakes? <laughs> if maybe you get that promotion, if you get into this school or, or get that job or marry that particular boy or girl or get up to this salary level, maybe win a prize and so on. Again, look at how easy it is for us to trust in this world and treat this world as if it were the be all and end all, rather than looking to Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God, as our all and all. Jesus said to Peter, blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. So we Pray, may the Father sink this knowledge, this faith, this hope, this trust ever more deeply into us so that we live with Jesus as our hope and our confidence. Now, it was odd enough that Peter should call Jesus the Christ at all, but it was even odder that Peter called Jesus Christ at that particular moment in our Lord's public ministry, for things were not going well with Jesus' ministry, humanly speaking. If you were to identify someone, as Yahweh's anointed servant sent to bring all of history to fulfillment, wouldn't you expect that one to be received by open arms? Right? That the kings and the powerful of this world would come and bow before him, that his glory would shine out and overpower the darkness? But that wasn't what was happening at that moment. The Pharisees had decided Jesus must die. The leaders in Jerusalem had determined that he must die. The people of Galilee, who had once flocked to him in droves when he was raising the dead and casting out demons and healing every kind of illness, were now abandoning him because he said strange things, hard to understand. Like, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. When Peter called Jesus the Christ there up in the region of Caesarea Philippi, it did not look like Jesus was accomplishing anything, much less bringing God's kingdom to earth. And again, in our own day, right, we tend to wonder about the church and what it is accomplishing, whether the church has the kind of influence and success in the world that marks it as a real tool in God's hand, or whether we're missing something. And yet, if Christ is our all in all, if we confess him as the center of all things, then as long as we walk in his ways, we have to trust that as Son of the living God, He is working all things according to His wisdom and grace. So the Spirit moves us to confess Jesus is the Christ and we live with Him as our hope, as our comfort, as our life, which is why the meal at this altar is such a big deal. For there, with His own body of blood given and shed for us, we are built upon the rock. We are made His church. We are given to stand against hell. As we confess Jesus to be Christ and believe we are the church built on the rock. For the confessing of Jesus as Son of the living God, come to fulfill all the Father's will, is the rock the church is established on. It is the rock that the wise man built his house on, so that when it was beaten by the wind and the rain, it stood 
fast, likewise the church stands fast on Christ. Even as hell opens its gates and sends forth attack after attack after attack, the church remains. Hell can accomplish nothing. Jesus feeds us, he builds us up, he forgives us, he renews us so that we know that we are forgiven, that we know that we are his, and know that in him we are heirs and members of the kingdom already now. And so in faith, we strive to live like no matter what all else may be going on in the world, no matter what other hopes or fears may grip us, we seek to live as Christ ends, as those who know Jesus is the Christ. And we do that here in the church as we remember the keys that Jesus has given to the church, keys that over and close the kingdom of heaven, which is none other than absolution, the forgiveness of sins. It opens or it can close for those who do not repent. The church is founded on confessing Jesus as Christ of the living God, present and alive in the midst of his people, and hell cannot stand against the church, try though it might. And the church lives by handing on the forgiveness and the mercy and the release that it has received. You all have been set loose. You've been released in Christ from sin and death and even the life that you inherited from Adam and Eve. Jesus says that in his church, in the church with himself, has Christ in the church, sins are loosed just as they are loosed in heaven. And in the loosing is such a poignant image here. It's like seeing sins, chains, as cords that, that bind you, that bind you to guilt and to condemnation and to darkness and corruption, and yet they're all broken in Christ. For he binds himself to them in our place, set free, and then we can walk unencumbered and follow after him in grace and peace. No longer do we fear judgment, no longer do we seek the shadows, no longer do we live in alienation from God. He comes to us, and he takes us to himself, and we rest in him. Now, temptations are still there, old habits die hard, but released, set loose in Christ, made new, absolved, set free, there is a new path that lies before each of us. We can walk with Jesus, walk in his light. And Jesus says to us that to walk in his light is to live with him as Christ. And what that amounts to is pretty obvious, right? Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Seek to find out what the will of God is. And Paul even summarizes what that will is to the Galatians about the fruits of the Spirit. Gentleness, peace, joy, love, self-control, patience, kindness, and so on. We know what we are given to be in Christ. And the only reason that we ever pull back from that or fail to go forward is that we fear what we'll lose or we think maybe there's something better out there to be had. But there isn't. There's nothing to lose. Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God, and you have been set loose to follow Him. So rejoice and confess Him before the world, my friends, and follow, for you are blessed, dear friends. To you, the Father has given and revealed His Son. Hallelujah. Amen. And now may that peace that surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until the glorious day of His appearing. I invite you to stand and turn page 9 with the bulletin as we join together to sing it today. <laughs>
you a sense of pleasing in your sight. Grant stability, faith, and hope to all who are struggling in this economy, plus the people of Haiti, as they struggle to recover and establish a stable civil life, grant shelter and protection to all refugees, especially those displaced by the conflict in Syria. And finally, we ask you to send your spirit of peace to Somalia, Myanmar, the Ukraine, Venezuela, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Kenya, Nigeria, Burkina Faso, the Middle East, especially Gaza, Iraq, Egypt, Syria, and Yemen, and all places formed by war or civil strife. And Lord, in your mercy, we also ask that while our nation continues to live with peril and while many remain in harm's way, you would watch over us and show your mercy to all who are in danger or who suffer in any way. Comfort those who mourn, heal those who are injured, give wisdom and humility to those in authority. Continue to be with Derek Foot, Joshua Zook, Alex Zook, and all deployed and active military personnel and their families. Protect all of us and civilians who bring the wicked to justice. Defend the righteous and lead all to repent of evil and seek your peace. We know that all things are in your hands, Father, and we ask that you would bring justice and establish fair government according to your good and perfect will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, mighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings be ordered by your governance, may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
services evident. 